Good afternoon, everyone. So we are here today with Church and Society to get an update on the latest from Revised Social Principles. So I will kick it off. Thank you for coming. Um, we're kind of excited about what has just happened. We have all the sections of the Revised Social Principles passed. And Oh, and I'm, um, I got excited. Um, I'm Bishop Sally Dick, um, and I've, I've been the president of the General Board of Church and Society for the last eight years. So we are excited. This is an historic moment, and, um, and it's taken 12 years to get here. Um, it's taken over 1,000 people to have input, and I think we just saw the effects of that. I would add to the excitement, the 12-year period of work on this was uh, represented the entire church. So this is a gift from the church to the church. It is a gift of social witness that will become a guide to us as we study and as we move. Basically, the only change that was made to it was just made. And even that, however confusing the process became, represented people from central and jurisdictional conferences working together, listening to one another, and trying to find a path forward. That, my friends, is the way this, this entire process has worked from beginning to end. Every single word from every single United Methodist around the world was read and studied and reflected upon. And we have everyone to thank for this. Say your name. Oh, I'm Mary Elizabeth Moore, and I was editor and coordinator of the writing and editing teams for the social principles. Uh, and I'm Dr. Randall Miller. I'm a lay person from the California Nevada Annual Conference. Uh, and I chaired the internal board committee that worked on the social principles. Um, I'm just gratified that after a period of 12 years and all of the input we, co uh, we uh, collected, um, that the general conference has seen fit to approve the social principles with the change that we just saw. It was uh, an amazing undertaking uh, over the period of 12 years. Um, the visits and consultations all around the world, uh, including in the Philippines, the US, Europe, uh, and uh, Africa. Um, it's just amazing uh, to think that all of that input and that new process of developing a, a global church document uh, has been received uh, by the General Conference because not all documents that we produce for previous general conference have been so welcome, so I'm just thrilled. Let me let Andy go first. Yeah, thank you everyone. My name is uh, Reverend Andy Emanuel. I am a clergy f um, from the United Methodist Church in Nigeria. And I want to say that we are so much grateful for what is, has happened today in this general conference. Um, I have been part of the writing team for this social principle and uh, our work have been approved by the General Conference, and this is very, very grateful to everyone that is coming from Africa, because if you look at this document, I see relevancy, I see inclusiveness, that all the voices, the concern that we have about how this document is going to impact us all over the world have been addressed. So I, we are looking forward to a ministry that is relevant, a ministry that is inclusive, a ministry that respects each context of uh, uh, our global connection. So that has adequately been addressed in the social principle. So we are very grateful and happy that the voice of Africa, the voice of Europe, the voice of Philippines and every one of us that is part of this great movement has been hard. So uh, we, are, we are very appreciative of the work our connection is doing. Thanks, Andy. And I'm, my name is John Hill. I serve as the Interim General Secretary for the Board of Church and Society. And just echo the comments that have been made so far. 
uh, the gratitude for the General Conference having received this love letter, as Randall often refers to it, um, and understood and appreciated the voices and the hopes of the connection, the global connection that was that were present in this in this document. And I feel like the work that happened on the floor today clarified the way in which this will expand and support ministry across a variety of contexts. Um, our goal was, and our charge from the General Conference was to create a document that was succinct, that it was theologically grounded, and that it was globally relevant and resonant. Uh, clearly, the General Conference has affirmed that work, and I think the work of today's amendment um, ensured that that was understood deeply um, in central conferences uh, on the particular issue of marriage. So grateful for the uh, clarifying amendment and for the adoption of the whole. And I think we're happy to answer any questions folks have. Eric Alsgaard from the Baltimore Washington Conference. Just for clarification, when did these new social principles go into effect? So like all actions of the General Conference, unless specified in the legislation, they will take effect January 1, 2025. Uh, we will work between now and then to update our resources and make sure that uh, the resources that we have from the General Church and from the Board of Church and Society reflect the changes that uh, were adopted here at General Conference. Can I just add to that? Yeah. <clears throat> but I think um, we would encourage the church to begin to read them, and those resources will come out, and you'll have study materials. But we've been, in many respects, in a pause on uh, social principles <laughs> over the last eight years because everybody was anticipating these. So it was my observation, maybe it's more anecdotal, but it was my observation people weren't studying the social principles that we had. And I feel that that's part of the slip we've had on our identity. And so the sooner we can begin to really ground ourselves in who we are as United Methodists in these social principles, the better. So just encourage people to start reading them. Kelly Turney, Love Your Neighbor Coalition. Just wanted to hear the gratitude and the excitement. And I wanted to see if you could say a few more words, because I know you said earlier you wanted to offer a gift that was not a patchwork of sentences over the last 40 years, but this beautiful document. And since it was amended from the floor, <laughs> I, I wanted you to say a little bit more about how you felt that change in the definition of marriage affected the kind of gracious uh, way you were trying to write that document. Yeah, I, I, um, so uh, we didn't know that that amendment was going to come beforehand, uh, although we anticipated that there will be some conversation and discussion and debate on the floor about the, uh, the definition of marriage, if you want to put it that way. Um, it, it, I just, uh, it, that uh, amendment came from someone who uh, will be on our judicial council starting uh, after general conference. Uh, and I just thought it was a beautiful example of someone trying to bridge cultures and uh, make space for everyone to be included. So um, uh, that's the kind of love letter to the church that I was referring to. People who want to be a part of the United Methodist Church and instead of um, trying to divide us, building bridges so that we can all feel that we're a part of this big tent called United Methodism. Yeah, when we were uh, working on the social principle, our understanding was to build a document that is relevant to every culture, theologically grounded, and also succinct to what we're doing. And we are so much grateful that what we see with the amendment that was uh, pass on the floor of the general conference, um, we're able to put into consideration theological understanding that is uh, relevant across the globe. So as Render said, though, that we don't expect that to come, but it has come and is something that resonates with most of us. 
and and speaking from an African perspective, I think many worries that people have about this document, um, I think are addressed, and it's going to be uh, it is going to be uh, considered highly considered <coughs> across churches in Africa. Hi there, Kristen Caldwell, Oregon Idaho Conference. I'll just ask you <coughs> one quick question. Um, do you get to breathe a little <laughs> bit now? How do you feel? I do. Well, I, we <clears throat> we had a long pause in the process because we were we were ready to present the social principles four years ago. So it did feel like we got some chance to breathe now, but it does feel like this kind of long project has come to an end and um, I'm excited for churches uh, to see churches and other folks using the social principles as, as we go along. I um, One of the reasons why I call it a love letter to the church is because we started 12 years ago and if you read through the social principles, it uh, by God's grace and maybe the foresight of the writers, uh, they speak to our time right now. So 12 years ago, we could not have, well, I could not have imagined that we would have gone through disaffiliations. But if you read the preamble, it offers guidance about how we deal with conflict in Christian settings and speaks directly into the heart of uh, dis disaffiliation. And one of our key struggles, which is how do we live with each other with a variety of theological beliefs uh, and uh, social social beliefs as well. So, so that's a long way of saying yes. We do get to pause now. Those of us who are not working on the the study materials, and uh, yeah, it's a, a good feeling. It is, and I'll add one one thing. I think that it's very good that we have four years now for people to live with the social principles mm -hmm. and to live into them. I, yes, social principles are always open to revision in every general conference. But rather than jump into revisions now, we have a chance in this new day of our denomination to live into these principles, to study them deeply, and to let them guide our social witness. That, to me, is going to be a great help as we try to live into the decisions that have been made right here in this particular general conference. Craig Taylor, Kentucky Annual Conference. I was actually blessed to receive some of those preliminary study materials you talked about in 2019. Uh, when I did a Young Clergy Summit visit with the General Board of Church and Society. And so I've been greatly anticipating uh, this work coming forward because I got to see a little window into what that physical work would be beyond the Book of Discipline. Is there an anticipated uh, time in which we could have those materials beyond just the text uh, within the Book of Discipline? Is that something we might know at this time? Because they're wonderful. <laughs> Very good question. I take that question along with the question about breathing. Um, hold those two in, in tension. Um, so we will breathe and we will be, um, we, we do have some materials that were prepared in advance. Um, and as Bishop Dick named, the, the desire for folks to begin exploring these even before they are the official policy of the church. Um, so, but we expect that in a matter of a few months. I'm looking for Jeff in the back of the room. And he's giving me the thumbs up. Yeah. Hi, Ben Smith, Holson Conference. As we celebrate the coming adoption of these new revised social principles, um, I wonder if you all have any reflection on the leadership that John Hill has provided and um, then who will be stepping into the role um, moving forward. Well, John, John has just been terrible. <laughs> I'll answer that. <clears throat> John Hill has just been magnificent. And um, yes, um, he, <clears throat> he is, <clears throat> I'm sorry, he has overseen the work of GBCS just seamlessly 
um, since becoming the uh, interim general secretary. And because of that, um, also, we're able to move into uh, the, the strategy um, and uh, the, you know, just coming to this point today. <clears throat> and so we just can't say enough ab about John Hill's leadership, and he also really, really hates it when we do, which is fun. And, um, uh, and we look forward <clears throat> to the new general secretary. He is not an in interim. He is the next general secretary for GBCS, and he will officially begin September 1, um, Julius Trimble. Uh, he'll be retiring August 31st as a bishop, and um, he, he's had a, a deep commitment to justice ever since um, he was a very young person. Um, he stayed very connect. He was on the board once, and he stayed very connected with all the issues that are important to GBCS. He too will, in terms of the the things that we promote, um, primarily uh, around uh, peace and the planet and immigration, and uh, all of those. Uh, he'll step right into that with uh, a good message for the church and the world. And I just want to add one thing, not about me, but just the fact that none of this would have been possible without the other folks on this dais, uh, without Neil Christie's leadership, without Susan Henry Crow's leadership. Oh, yeah. This has been a 12-year uh, race, and I was privileged to have the leadership baton for the last 20 meters right, of this long marathon. And so I just want to name that, and I think what we saw in the way that this was embraced by the General Conference, the way it was embraced broadly by the church in advance of General Conference, mm -hmm. um, it felt like there was so much support coming into this um, that it was only for us to kind of manage a few of the details to make sure that the, the logistics happen and, the, and that ultimately across the finish line. Sorry, that I, Eric Alsgaard, Baltimore, Washington. If I'm not mistaken, the language that was added by the amendment includes the words age of consent. Can you explain why you think that language was put in and why that's important? Why? Well, um, so I know in the African context, there's been quite a conversation about, for example, uh, child marriage. So I. I suspect that part of why um, the amender put it in was to to be sure that marriage to to be sure that marriage was happening with adults of consenting age, and I I think that's uh, been really critical in terms of um, improving uh, um, the life of girls and women in Africa and other places around the world, and. To, to uh, ensuring that uh, young girls and young women um, are not subject to repeated pregnancies at a very young age, which uh, increases uh, mortality for both uh, the babies and the mothers. So that's what I heard in the offering of it. And then, of course, um, just in terms of sexual ethics, consent is, the, is a key part of uh, any relationship uh, uh, in terms of um, uh, just having mutual respect for one another uh, in terms of uh, sexual actions and behavior. So, so that I suspect it was the, making sure that there was a clear stance against uh, child marriage is why she said that. And child marriage is the next section, but you know, it really makes it coherent. Yeah. As Renda said, the issue of child marriage is a great challenge in Africa. We have a lot of issues that children of young age are compelled into going into marriage, most especially in most polygamous uh, families. So uh, uh, age concern is a key concept in that principle to protect those minors who would be forced to get married. So I think that is in order. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.